Welcome back to the channel, everyone. My name is Jacob Hegland, and today we're going to be talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. We're going to be talking about graph neural networks. Now, this is the third video in a series about graph neural networks, and we're going to be talking about some more advanced techniques like combining time series models and graph models to capture important temporal and spatial aspects of your data. If you appreciate videos like this and want to see more like it in the future, then please hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm and please subscribe to the channel. It really helps out and I appreciate it. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. So as we've discussed in previous videos, graphs are extremely useful for modeling real-world systems. And the real power of graphs comes from their ability to model entities and their relationships. So for example, in engineering systems, especially transportation engineering, you might consider um, airports and their connections, or in the natural sciences, maybe chemistry, you might think of atoms and chemical bonds, or in even language modeling, you might consider words and their contexts. These are all things that can be defined in terms of a graph. And there are tons of examples. Um, you can basically find examples in almost any uh, area, of, area of study. Graph neural networks, then, are a highly scalable class of models that can learn on graph structured data, which allows you to extract features automatically from these graphs. And by learning, of course, I mean optimizing these models with stochastic optimization tools using some type of loss function. And the big idea here is that if you can define a graph, then graph neural networks can capture features on that graph. However, this puts a big job in your hands where you have to make sure that the graph that you're defining actually reflects the system that you're studying. So if you define an incorrect graph with respect to the system you're studying, you're just going to get nonsense out. So graphs can be extremely useful for modeling real world systems, but how can we make these models even better? So as we've discussed so far, um, a basic graph does not explicitly consider features on a, on a graph. So if you just have graph neural network acting on this set of nodes and edges here, then you're just going to be capturing some type of structural information. So for example, you might be counting the number of neighbors or the centrality of individual nodes or things like this. And the sort of solution here is that we want to use attributed graphs. So what we're going to do is we're going to add on these sets of features for the vertices and for the edges. And, you know, this is kind of a technical detail, but most existing architectures uh, will only consider these uh, node features. However, there's a very simple trick that you can do if you want to use edge features. Uh, so you want to look at the dual or the line graph, and you can see these papers if you want to really look at the details there. So features seem like a very powerful way to, in fact, make our graph models better reflect the real world. And indeed, this is the first step towards making our graph models better. Except we are kind of limited here. So we have static structure and static features, and we might want to play with these things a little bit so that they can vary over time. So for example, one question we might ask is, how do we want to deal with a graph that has a static structure and time varying features? Well, in this case, we're just going to be sampling our features over time. And this is what's known as a spatiotemporal graph. The other question we might ask is, how do we uh, look at a very general graph that has a time varying structure and time varying features? And we're going to be looking at this in the next video in the series. So the question we'll be answering in this video is then, how do we deal with graphs that have a static structure and time varying features? And these types of graphs are surprisingly common. So for example, if we're looking at a road network, we may consider you know, individual segments of a road as nodes on a graph, and then the connections between those segments as edges. So this graph will not really change that much over time. However, what will change over time is the amount of traffic that's traveling on each segment of the road um, within a given time period. And that's really what we want to capture with this time varying feature matrix that we'll be looking at here. So to answer this question, we first need to understand some of the basic tools from time series forecasting, and these tools will help us to deal with some of the time varying graph features. So one of the first things to understand about time series data is that time series data is fundamentally different than spatial data or data that is just drawn from a distribution, because you have this notion of causality or the arrow of time. And basically what this means is that data in the past will be highly correlated with future values of the data. And it's not like you can't uh, have an IID assumption or anything like that. And basically what you want to do is go read a textbook on this topic and do some exercises to learn the basics. Um, there's this excellent textbook out there, Forecasting and Principles in Practice, and it's available for free online, which I think is amazing. And when we're dealing with time series data, there's many new tools that we want to be able to use and that you should at least be aware of before you start trying to deal with time series data. So when you're plotting your data, just very basic plots that you can make of your data include correlation and autocorrelation plots. And these will basically allow you to see how correlated your data is with previous time steps. Uh, you can also look at time analysis versus frequency domain analysis. And this will basically allow you to, so in the time domain, for example, you're just plotting points of your data um, at discrete intervals. 
but with frequency domain analysis, you're actually looking over the entire time domain and you're breaking down your signal into different frequencies, which can also be very useful for looking at signalized data. And finally, if you use something, if you're trying to estimate states of a system, you might want to look at using a Kalman filter or some type of similar extension of it, like extended Kalman filters or unscented Kalman filters. And these can basically allow you to estimate states of a dynamical system without being able to directly observe them. And there may be noise in the system as well. So the question that we'll be really focusing in on today is that of predicting future values of our time series versus past values of our time series. And this process is known as time series forecasting. And there are tons of models that exist for this, so we really, ha we really have a lot of tools at our disposal. One of the more basic models that we could use is an ARMA-type model. And basically what this model will do is compute a multilinear regression over time. And these models work great for smaller data sets, especially in economics and business, where you might have like monthly, monthly generated data, like sales revenue or things like that. And you just want to, can do, you just want to do a, a one month forecast, for example, or a, th a few months in the future. Now, one of the downsides to using this model is that it requires a stationary generating process, which means that if your process is not already stationary, you'll have to manually, manually go in and remove any trends or any periodic elements in your signal. Now, neural network-based models can be very useful. And some specific neural network uh, time series prediction models include recurrent neural networks, so LSTMs or GRUs, temporal convolutions, or temporal attentions. And you can see these papers for uh, more details on these, but I'll just give a broad overview of them. So of the recurrent neural networks, um, these are pretty much what you would learn in any uh, intro to ML course, and they were historically developed first. And basically what they'll do is they'll look at your input sequence one element at a time, compute some embedding of that, and then compute some hidden state that is passed on, and then you just keep going like that. This is kind of an issue though, because you're only handling your elements of your input sequence one element at a time. So there's no real parallel processing that you can do. And this means that they don't scale very well to very long sequences. And you have to use a process known as backpropagation through time to train as well, um, which can lead to very long training times. Now, temporal convolutions sort of solve this because they are basically learning a 1D convolutional filter over um, your input sequence, and it basically acts like a sliding window, right? So that means you can calculate the weights of your window uh, in parallel, and you don't have to do this backpropagation through time. So it actually solves a lot of the issues um, that are posed by recurrent neural networks. And then further developments include temporal attention, which add more parallelism by learning weighting embeddings over each element of your input sequence. And it will individually compute the weights between um, these and your predicted value. And this will basically, um, this basically allows for very fast training of these models. So now that we've learned some tools for time series forecasting, we'll now look at combining these tools with graph neural network tools in order to learn over sequences of graph data to predict future values of graph data. Now, time series data is typically assumed to be discrete, which means when we extend this to a graph domain, we'll be learning over time slices of graphs, which means we'll have the entire graph at time one, the entire graph at time two, etc. And we'll be learning over that input sequence to predict some value in the future. Now, one thing that's important to note about this problem is that we have a static graph structure. And importantly, what this allows us to do is that we can use a standard graph neural network and combine it with some type of temporal block. Let it be an LSTM or a temporal convolution or a temporal attention. And it's, it's easier to look at the code for this. So I'm just going to hop into some pseudocode examples and we can get an idea of basically how this would work in practice. Now, the particular architecture we're going to be looking at is known as a spatiotemporal graph neural network. And these things are actually fairly straightforward to implement, given that you have some experience implementing machine learning models on your own. Now, here's an example, a high-level example in pseudocode. Um, this provides like an overview of the entire class. Now, we're going to be looking at these specific methods in the future slides. So pause here if you want to get a high-level overview of what the entire class will look like. So in the init method of our spatiotemporal graph neural network model, we'll basically be defining two things. And these are the spatial block and the temporal block. So the special thing that you can do is that you can decompose your problem into the spatial domain and the temporal domain and basically treat them with two separate machine learning models. So with the spatial block, we're defining a graph neural network, which can pretty much be any standard graph neural network from the literature, or maybe it's a model that you have experience with and want to see how it extends to a temporal domain. And extending it to a temporal domain is really easy because then we can define this temporal block. And this can be anything like a temporal convolution or temporal attention. LSTM, GRU, any of these things. Um, I've just chosen temporal convolution because it's what I personally have the most experience with. 
And then finally, we have this fully connected layer, which will pretty much act as a decoder um, for changing the size of our output uh, for computing the loss. Then in the forward method, we have uh, pretty much two inputs. So we have first our X matrix, which is a matrix of node features. And the shape of this thing is given as the batch size by the number of nodes, by the number of features per node. And then finally, the number of previous time steps that we'll be considering in our time series data. And then we have this A matrix. This is the adjacency matrix, and this is potentially sparse. And basically what it will do is it will define connections between nodes in the graph. <clears throat> and this could be given as a list of uh, connections between edges, or sorry, connections between nodes, or it could just be given as a big matrix that's n by n. Now, when we're actually going through our model, um, this is just an example that I've seen in a few different architectures, but it's not necessarily something that's set in stone. Now, the first block that we'll be sending our data through is this temporal block, and we don't need to give this any data about the structure of the graph. We're simply learning over sequences of data. So we have time one, time two, time three, and we're combining all of these together to predict at time four. Then, once we have this temporal embedding, we're going to send this through a spatial block, with a, which is just going to be some type of graph neural network, and we tell it um, the structure of the graph through this adjacency matrix. And then we can send it through another temporal block. You don't necessarily have to have this, um, but I've seen that it works pretty well in practice. And then you can repeat these steps um, as many times as you want to make the, the architecture a little bit deeper. But at the very end, you will send it through your fully connected layer decoder and then output whatever the embedding is for prediction or computing or loss or things like that. So in summary, we now have an idea of how to deal with graphs with the static structure and time varying features. Tools from time series forecasting be, can be extremely useful, especially when considering your time varying features and conducting basic analyses of these features can help you better understand the temporal aspects of your data and help you select what type of model that you might actually want to use. Neural network approaches can be extremely efficient when you're doing um, things like temporal convolutions or attention based methods. And these can be great for learning over longer sequences of data. And finally, you can decompose your data into a space and a time dimension and this allows you to compute a spatiotemporal embedding by combining a standard GNN with a temporal block in a single model. If you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it in the future, then please hit that like button for the YouTube algorithm and consider subscribing to the channel. If you want to start a discussion about what we talked about here today, then please feel free to do so down in the comments section below. And if you're a machine learning researcher or practitioner, I'm particularly interested to hear how you're using graph neural networks in your work, or if you've considered using them and maybe didn't do them uh, for some reason, I'm really interested to hear about that. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.